Welcome to the Andrew D'Angelo podcast. Constant Constance. Each week, Andrew, renowned jazz saxophonist and brain cancer survivor, invites us to look at the many worlds of his guests with conversations that cover all the arts, human resilience, a little bit of politics, and a lot of humour. You can't fail to have a fantastic time. Hey everyone, and welcome. How are you doing today, tonight, this morning, whenever you're listening to this? We are here today with the amazing pianist, composer, curator, um, MacArthur Fellow, Kennedy Center Artistic Director of Jazz, uh, improviser, band leader, visual artist. I feel like I, Jason, uh, Jason Moran, I feel like I could go like an entire hour just like listing all of your credentials. No, nah, but you know, that, that'd be a short chorus. But all right. <laughs> now we're going over the same shit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember where, I think it was uh, our friend Ted Reichman said, uh, Jason, doesn't need an introduction. Everybody knows who Jason Moran is. Um, oh, y'all you're, sweet. you're doing uh, his on uh, Sunday, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's cool. good to, you know, like I think in the community of musicians, like you all, you know, who really want to have the conversation, you know, so it has become a really important part of the evolution of the music mm. is actually the talking about it, you know? Yes. I, you know, like Art Taylor's Notes and Tones, you know, like, Right. Just to like now, nah, let's make sure we have some of the dialogue about it. So I'm appreciative. I, you know, I, uh, I listened to your WMYC interview, which I believe you did for Memorial Day this year, right? 2021. Is that correct? Right, right. right. That was a great, great interview. I really enjoyed it. And I was fascinated with this um, James Reese Europe. Yeah. And let me tell you that of the, people I, I mentioned that you were coming on the show and then mentioned, is it really, is that really his name? James Reese Europe? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't know somebody had a last name Europe and yeah. I know he was able to bring jazz over to Europe, which is really cool in world yeah. war one, but yeah. nobody had heard of him. Of the like three or four people that I, I mentioned it to and mm. they're all musicians. It, very interesting, right? It is, you know, there's a peculiar part about, let's just say American history, since it's like adolescent country, you know, about how soon we forget, you know, and certain parts of history, of course, they all repeat, you know, because they repeat because people die. <laughs> right, right. Hey, that happens sometimes, uh, right? Yeah, I forgot what happened, you know. <laughs> so, you know, um, but James Reese Europe, like, yeah, you know, my teacher, Jackie Bayard, had talked about him a little bit, and then I met Randy Weston, Mm. And Randy Weston sat me down for a whole afternoon to give me the full on lecture about how important James Reese Europe was. And Randy Weston also had his own James Reese Europe project. And it just also, yeah, it was just a name that kind of gets omitted. I think it gets omitted for a lot of reasons, but, but I think it gets omitted because then you have to start to talk about how he thought about black musicians away from the stage. And then you have to start to talk about equality and freedom and struggle and demands on the workplace. And you have to start to talk about these things, which when you only want to talk about, you know, well, what kind of saxophone do you use, Andrew? You know, what's your mouthpiece, right? right? Then it gets away, right. which is a part of it too, but it get, it pulls away, you know? And, and Europe was really concerned about a community. Um, and he was doing anything he could to amplify the voice of the community. I, 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 I don't know if you're you're up for it, but I, I have two things. I'd love to hear when you say how black musicians were treated off the stage. Mm -hmm. And I also love that story you told that they wanted him to get a band together, right? A military band. And mm -hmm. so he really wasn't in the mood or something. You can you can correct me here, but he, he asked for like a quarter of a million dollar uh, yeah, the feet. equivalent. Yeah. Equivalent. Yeah. I was like, "All right, man. I like this guy. <laughs> right. I like this guy. Because he, because he wanted to go to war to fight. Wow. He's like, no, nah, I want to go shoot at people. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. You know, and like that's what. You know, and then they were like, "Wait a minute, James Reese Europe. This guy plays Carnegie Hall. He has his own union for musicians. He's like innovated all these dances. Like he's hit, writes these hit songs. Wait, right. that guy? He wants right. to be here. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on." 
let's make sure, let's get him a band. And he's like, it, co it cost this. And then he really did go out and curate a band, you know? Right. And, and that, you know, that's a, it's a powerful move. Um, but it's also, that's what he was trying to make the stake and stake the claim for was that this ain't, this can't be for free. It needs to be something that packs power and that's gonna need a certain kind of excellence. I'm gonna have to go look for in the musicians and to train them and then to bring them into a territory. Nobody knows what that's gonna be like, you know? Right. I didn't, I'm not in any armed serv in the services, you know? A few of my family, my father, you know, a lot of, of course that generation, people had to do that, you know, out right. of the draft. But, um, my, I don't have a bunch of family members that did that, you know. Um, so to think about James Reese Europe also kind of like really staking like a, a new space for kind of citizens, citizenry in America, especially black citizenry and the demand on it. Right. And to really confront the racism that was just woven into every part, you know, of disrespect. Um, and he was really going to get in there. He wasn't afraid of it. I mean, you know, he's way braver than I'll ever be, you know, um, in in what he was willing to sign up for, even as a composer. <laughs> you know. Well, it, it, it's it's interesting because what spawned this interview than other than I just absolutely, you know, have so much respect for you and admiration, and I'd still like you to answer this whole thing of how black musicians were treated off stage and what James Reese Europe. Did if, if if you're up for it. If not, then we'll just let it go. But uh, I saw you make this Twitter post where somebody was making a proclamation that Paul Whiteman and I think <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? about? Yes. <laughs> and was it Glenn Miller? Was that the other band? And you know, it was just like like was claiming that they had like started save jazz. It. Yeah, save jazz. And you made some I, I it wasn't a snarky comment, it was a very intelligent comment, but I was like, all right. I gotta have Jason on because this is this that not your post, but the original post that I think you re retweeted, right? Yeah, was then, just, it it was, then it disappeared. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't find it. I was gonna bring it on, but I, it's like I am scrolling through your Twitter. I'm totally like you know trolling you or whatever, and uh, but like to make this pro proclamation with this photo of like all white musicians, all white crowd. And these are the people that saved the music. It's like, yeah. give me a Kurt, fucking break, man. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's, and, you know, it's hurtful, you know? And yeah. um, I think mostly, I think it's just hurtful and, um, and disrespectful and so short sighted and just like no kind of sense of even what that looks like, even if you don't know any of the history, <laughs> but just let's just read that as a sentence <laughs> and let you just look at the words next to one another. And what does that say? And just was the wrong story at the wrong time. And, um, and also, you know, it just, yeah, it does a thing that, you know, I've had students, I'm sure you have too, say some really interesting things about kind of lopsided history you know, young mind, like I, I know the music because of this, right? And so, you know, I remember students showing up and saying that Bill Evans is where most jazz piano starts. I said, look, you can't sit in here and be my student then walk out here and say, you study with me and say some shit like that. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Just can't allow right. it. But there are things that I can happen. allow. Not gonna I happen. cannot allow that. <laughs> right, well, but, but don't you think that, and this is also something that was, like going through my mind as I was listening to that WMYC interview. And if you want, I'll put a link for people if they want to find it. Cause yeah. by the way, folks, it is a really great interview. It's well edited. The audio is great. The content's amazing. And it's, it's, it's uh, well worth your time, but part of the, I mean, we just, there's like what one recording of James Reese Europe, maybe two, yeah. right? So one, isn't yeah, part yeah, yeah. There's a couple, right? There's is, some records he made before then, yeah. But isn't that part of our memory? Like, let's say yeah. one of our students is 22 or 25, right. yeah. And so what are they doing? They're going on what Spotify or YouTube or whatever. Yes, that's it to listen yeah. to music. Right. And this, they're not going to find music. Yeah, no, that, no, they're for, not. Right, they're not. They're not going to find it. And um, it's like Buddy Bolden, right? There's no recording of Buddy Bolden, you know, hmm. for all the the mythology around the brilliance of this musician who kind of gets Louis Armstrong 
out of the bed, you know, and then King Oliver. Of course, we have the records of King Oliver, but we do not have Buddy Bolden. Interesting. But for James Reshear, we have that one record because that's his celebratory, I'm come, I'm home from the war. Here's how great this band sounds. And they wow. make that record. And then he's murdered during the celebratory tour. He's murdered by the drummer in the band. Oh my so God. I that, remember that part. I was like, wait, what? Is, yeah, is Jason a, just making up some shit? I knew you weren't. <laughs> I knew you weren't. But like, you know, what we got this Cuomo thing going on at, oh at the point of this interview. We've got yeah. the COVID, maybe yeah. the Delta variant. We got masks. Yeah. We got vaccines. Yeah. We got the Donald Trump saying yeah. he still won the election. There's all this yeah. stuff going on. I'm listening to this interview and you're like, yeah, dude got stabbed in the neck. Thought he'd be OK. Right. And right. said, just keep playing the gig and then ends up dying that night. I mean, yeah. insane. It is insane. It's, you know, like these are stories that, you know, they shock the world, you know, and, and especially right. the world of Harlem and what he meant to the future to, to set up the Harlem Renaissance. He dies in 19, uh, 1919. And so he set, he's the setup for the Harlem Renaissance, especially on the music front. So all those musicians who follow him, Noble Sissel and UB Blake, and who make all those you know songs on Broadway, James P. Johnson, and this is gorgeous photograph of Duke Ellington standing at the grave offering a wreath to James Reese Europe. Wow! Now we've seen lots of photographs of Jam of, of Duke Ellington, tons of beautiful images of him. Right. You have not seen him stand at the grave in total humility in 1932, standing at the grave of James Reese Europe. It's 13 years after the death, right? That's how fresh it was for Ellington, who we, I think, rightfully so champion as a really, like a kind of an emblem of, of how to do the music, you know, however he figured that out, I don't know. Well, you, but, you know, can I just interrupt and just yeah. like make a notation here that when I was coming up, in, I don't know, junior high and high school and playing in big bands and playing standards and everything. Mm. The first time I heard Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn's music, mm. it changed my whole perception of what jazz composition could be, the orchestration. And I think you made yeah. a comment, something about big or the orchestra, right? Yeah. I don't want to yeah. put words in your mouth, yeah, yeah, but yeah. for me as a kid, I was like, wait, you can do this in jazz, right? It's right. like Stravinsky or something. Yes. I, yeah. I don't know if that's a fair comparison. There was something I was listening to of you where Stravinsky came to my mind, but yeah. I was just like, this is like an orchestra piece composed yeah. by this man with this heavily working band. Yeah. It sounds amazing. They're super tight. And yeah. uh, it was, uh, and his mother called him Bill, I think was the, I, that's what I usually yeah. reference, but I'm not yeah. sure. If yeah, that was no, that, that's, that's totally it, you know? Where did you grow up? Uh, Seattle. Seattle, right? So you're way out there on the West Coast, you know? Yeah, way And I was, there. you know, listening to Ellington. I'm Down. way out there in more ways than one, Jason. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> you know, but like here in Ellington, also um, in the South, you know, there were just parts that I could understand. And then I really understood them when I got up North, in the Northeast specifically. And I had this theory about, you know, about, I mean, it's simplistic to a degree, but you know, culture for music is all, is also wound up in, in the diet and and have this thing about the Ellington and Strayhorn are able to achieve these colors in music because they live through, you know, like a, a real four seasons kind of, you know, <laughs> geography, location, you know, the, the way right. the, the leaves look like in Texas, we didn't get that. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I, these rich, I, vibrant colors, you know. <laughs> I remember moving from the Pacific Northwest to New York in 1986 mm. in the winter i think it was october and november wow. and there were no leaves on the trees right. i had never seen this right as exactly. a kid we had evergreens they were right. green all year round i was like yeah. are these trees all dead and <laughs> and the, my friends were like nah it's just it's winter the, the leaves have fallen off they'll come back in the spring yeah. i don't know so yeah you're right all these <laughs> colors yeah and it's just uh yeah it, it's 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 also I heard Lee Konitz mm. speaking once to Ethan Iverson mm -hmm. and Lee was talking about, yeah, those guys just played all mm. the fucking time. Mm. That's all they did. They were on the tour bus they, every night. And right. Lee goes, you hear that solo that, I don't know, pick somebody, Lester Young or Ben Webster or whoever, pick somebody. He goes like, probably 
on some level had been playing that same solo every night on some mm. level. Right. Lee Got was like, too. Lee's like, maybe they were working it out as they, you know, played every night. But by the time they got into the studio, Lester mm -hmm. Young's solo was a solo he'd been working on for that tour. Mm -hmm. That's Lee's uh, take on it. And Ethan mm -hmm. seemed to agree. I have, I have no proof. I have no idea. But I, I was mm -hmm. kind of fascinated by it. But No, it is fascinating. Because also, like, I, you know, I've been thinking about, like, let's say, like Mozart, you know, like when you, you hear certain uh, eras of classical music, like they let you sing along, even though you don't know the thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, no, that's gonna repeat. Oh, okay, now I know it. You don't know it, but you feel like you know it, right? So you can sing along to it. Cause it's just pop music. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. right. It's the music of the time, you know? So like, and so, and so like Lester Young, I, I just know like all these horn players, like Von Freeman used to talk about it too. Like when people would come to town, you get in the front row so that you could sing the solo with them, you know? Wow. Uh, listen wow. to Flying Home, right? Like that's a, it's a thing. Like it's a, I want to hear, you don't want to hear Coleman Hawkins' Body of Soul. Like, is he going to play it every time like that? Something might be there of it. But there's that moment where, you know, you took a, cause this is like, I still can't imagine that, you know, like the way, you know, when you see these images of people going to the Savoy Ballroom or any of these places, and they're flipping out over big band music. <laughs> right. Like, 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 oh, like now they're like making all these dances. It's like going to see Prince back then or <laughs> yes, something like this, yeah. right? Like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. And um, I, okay, first of all, I knew you were going to bring up Mozart. So I have this notation that I wanted to bring up mm. with you. Mm -hmm. There's this, uh, you, you can see it on, uh, on YouTube. I think it's still up. Um, Cambridge, uh, London, there's a, a, a professor there who is postulating that Mozart never wrote out his parts, Ooh. that mm -hmm. they were all improvised. And the only reason they were written out was either his student or his sister. No one really seems to understand who, like when they would send the score to another orchestra and Mozart wasn't going to be there. Oh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. That somebody would write out a part. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's true but I'm fascinated by it yeah. and we have no recordings. So we don't know, we can't prove it, right. but I, I love exploring these kind of things. And I love the thought of sitting in the front row with Coleman Hawkins playing and singing along to his solo on body yeah. and soul. That, yeah. that is the kind of stuff that just gets me, uh, I don't know, I get yeah. very excited about that kind of, I, I, and in fact, what happened to that in, in this right. music? What yeah. happened to that? Yeah, where I would say part of it is there, right? Part of it, I think, still lives. Sure, still lives sure. in it. You know, I remember. You know, I'm trying when we were talking about this just a second ago. It did make me think. Okay, what concerts did I go to and totally flip out? And I didn't hold my voice. I just yelled out into the audience, right? Like, right. I remember seeing actually when I got to New York. I came in '93, and around that time, Kenny Garrett had a band at Sweet Basil, and I went to that concert. And a lot of other young musicians were in the audience and we screamed our heads off. <laughs> <laughs> like we were listening to Bad Brains or something, you know? Right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I, cause I was losing my mind. Like, like we just could, we could, I couldn't take it, you know? Um, and also because we were in a community of people who were also yelling at the stage and he was just brewing. The band was just, they were on fire. Kenny Kirkland, you, Jeff Tane uh, Watson, Nat Reeves band. Wow. And it, you know, it was like a, kind of a classic amazing. quartet of that era. Um, right. But I remember that. I love that feeling. And I, of course, I, if, if I go see other music, you're right, I have that feeling. Sometimes when Alicia and I, my wife, when we go see like uh, Handel, you know, at the Met, I had the same feeling. But she's like, you can't do that here. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but for the counter tenor, you cannot flip out over the aria. You know, like, ah! no, 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 no. I went to do you know the mo mostly Mo mozart festival i mean as somebody you help run the kennedy center so i'm sure you're a friend of mine got tickets and took me she's a class classical violinist and i was singing along to something i don't remember which piece but it was something familiar and she goes she goes Shh. and i was like what she goes you can't sing along like that i was like i'm singing along like i didn't even notice but i was like you know whatever the piece was it was just uh you know, we've all heard a lot of Mozart, but yeah. for me, it was uh, actually at Sweet Basil's as well. No, the Village Gate, mm. the World World Saxophone Quartet, Oliver mm. Lake, mm. Julius Hemphill, yeah. David Murray, Hamia Blewett. Yeah. yeah. And 
mm-hmm. like Julius Hemphill, man. <laughs> and he's really tall, right? right. And yeah. they're playing this music. I can't remember the name of the record that mm. I had already listened to a lot. I was like 20 or something. Mm. Maybe I was mm. 20. No, I think it was under 21. And New York was like, we don't really care. Just come in anyway. And it, <laughs> but I, I don't know if I screamed, but in I was inner screaming. I was like, holy <laughs> shit, this is good. Right? Yeah. And Julius yeah. had those dreads at the time. Right, right. And he looked cool yeah. and his sound and his vibrato yeah. Yeah. and his energy. Yes. And Oliver Lake had this huge sound. I didn't really yes. know David Murray or Hamiet. They're yeah. playing that well. Yeah. But I, I if I group. if I could have screamed. And yeah. I think we probably were smoking inside the village gate. Of Definitely you were. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's, it's just weird. Cause when you think, you know, like this uh, about James Reese Europe, or like even you were kind of contrasting that to Coltrane, I think invitation or um, uh, meditation, something on that, on mm-hmm. the WMYC mm-hmm. and some of those bootlegs of Coltrane. I mean, people are just partying. Yes. Uh, there, I, I, one of the one of the tapes I heard, and it really was a tape. I think this guy was trying to hit on this woman, or wow. maybe they, they were there on a date, but they were not being quiet. And Train was just I'm going, <laughs> going nuts. Right? It was that <laughs> that phase, right? Yeah. And I just, I'm I'm sorry, I have a bit of an agenda with you, but I loved when you said, yeah. you know, when your students are like, "Ooh, I can't stand this music." Like, do you understand what was fucking going on? <laughs> at that time, right? Like yeah. you couldn't vote because yeah. you were a woman <laughs> or you couldn't vote because you were black. Like yeah. Yeah. I could not be gay when yeah. trains like out there like yeah. screaming, I could not be yeah. making out with another dude in yeah. the room exactly. or I might get killed, right? right. And mm-hmm. so, so your students are like, well, I can't, this music is so weird. But yeah, yeah, it was fucking strange times, dude. Yeah. Or do yeah. that, whoever it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, over the weekend, well, actually, what's today? Thursday? Thursday. I guess it was Monday or whatever, Tuesday. I guess it was, maybe it was Tuesday. Anyway, Tuesday, I don't know if you've been watching. The, well, anyways, there's this thing called versus battles. And these versus battles have started with Swiss Beats, the producer, and Timberland started getting people together to kind of like, during the pandemic, like, let's have this kind of like battle with two famous MCs or hip hop groups or R&B singers, right? Or R&B groups. And they've been doing these series of, unbelievable battles, you know, where they just play one song after another, they trade songs. Wow. And so uh, the most recent one were two groups, grimy groups from New York, uh, Dipset and The Locks. And right, so I'm watching it, mind is blown because one guy, Jada Kiss, kind of really became like an all-star MVP that night. But in one of his lyrics, he says, this is just audio of the shit that I go through. You know, of the many things right. he said that night. Wow. <laughs> he said that. <clears throat> and um and and I and it made me think about my students, actually. It, it made and it made me think about myself and it made me think about the community of musicians, of 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 why we do what we do, uh, who do we think it's for. Um, you know, I often say that I have to make these songs some times for myself sometimes i have to make them for my grandfather so i get approval <laughs> right <laughs> like right. blues approval or, you know what i mean right. or for my mother yeah. for you know uh for all of these people that are in my life you know and uh and for the communities too um whether they hear it or not and there was, but him saying that you know was uh was i thought really you know affirming because i think us as artists we constantly need something to say like you know don't don't give up one, you know, uh, and, and, and keep shooting for it. And um, that, that you know, and so Train and all these other people, whoever, you know, people we know, people we don't know, have been trying to figure that out. You know, people in Seattle, right, that you heard when you were growing up, the local cat who was like, kept the stage open for young musicians to come play, you know, it's the same in Houston. Those people who did that cared enough about the future of it to not try to hog the stage, you know? <laughs> Um, so I, you know, that, but hearing him say, you know, audio of shit that I go through, you know, he, you know, yeah, it just for New York city also to think about where New York city was in the 20th century, where we are right now in the 21st century, very different place. Right. And we really have to contemplate the next hundred years too. But 
we do. And I don't know if you saw my note. You didn't respond to it. That mm. do you know Lucy Little? She no, no, her- no, no. I, I don't think I. Maybe if I, you know, I haven't been there a year and a half. So right. I so hope she, I do know Lucy. She just finished her master's in the spring, mm-hmm. and um, but one thing she said about you is you're you're pretty much a celebrity at New England Conservatory. <laughs> so because I was asking her like, is there any kind of like you know you know, something I can like throw at Jason that he wouldn't expect. And she goes, yeah, I just tell him that he's the freaking celebrity at NBC. Ah, yeah. That's so, unexpected. Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> Lu- Lu- Lucy's really cool. She makes some, she's a violinist. She makes great music. She awesome. does an amazing job of producing well, the podcast. First of all, congratulations to Lucy because any musician in the past few years that somehow stuck it out, um, because enough signs <laughs> right. might say, hmm, maybe you should think about something else. Right, you know? right. And and I can't give up on students right now as much as sometimes I'm like, oh, man, you know, I really have faith because I don't, I'm not a sideline person. A person who loves to, uh, to complain about the problems of our community and and not offer anything and and i feel like as a teacher that's my way to really be in there on the ground uh for countless years because of the teachers that i had who were on the ground and had faith in the future and didn't just say man them kids don't know nothing and i'm not gonna give them nothing either amen well come on you know (laughs) (laughs) andrew hill wasn't like that right (laughs) And yeah, I'm like 22. I don't know jack shit yet. Give me a chance, right? Like please, that kind of thing. Please, please give me <laughs> a chance. And yeah. it's uh, it's you're amazing. And I I I find you a very intuitive uh, person. Just I mean, as a musician, but just just in generally as an artist, and as as I don't know you that well as a professor, but you just well you do well you do because well okay maybe we don't, but <laughs> I always think about you know this time when. It was, it was, you know, which is part of the thing we've probably been missing, you know, this traveling part. And some, we were getting on some airline, you were with uh, Matt Wilson's band, maybe. Were you with Matt Wilson's band? Or was it some other band? You said, I don't know if I can carry all this on together. Jason, You can you carry my saxophone on? Get so- out of here. Come on, really? Yes. You don't wow. remember this? <laughs> no. And so, and um, I don't remember where we were. We may have been in Europe. We may have been in America. I can't remember. And uh, saxophone case, pink zebra, yeah, print, maybe, <laughs> yeah. right? I still, um, I still have that case. Yeah, you know, piano players never have anything in their hands, so you're right, like, yeah, right. can you, <laughs> can you carry? Oh this? wait, oh yeah, we were in Europe. We were yeah. on the Rising Stars tour, Matt with Matt Wilson, <clears throat> and that was the tour that we did a double bill with Matt's band with BB King, and one of the guys in B.B. King's band came up to me and said, man, that saxophone case is tight. <laughs> and then he, and then he just walked away. Like he didn't like talk to me for a while. He, and, and then everybody in Matt's band like was kind of watching and like, why didn't you talk to the dude? And I was like, I don't know. Cause he just kind of walked up to me and said, that saxophone case is tight. tight. <laughs> but it, it's a, that, See, that's why I don't remember at first the whole ask, you know, thank you for carrying my saxophone. But like anytime <laughs> that moment, right? With BB King's, I think I don't remember who it was, his drummer mm. or something, but mm. it, it, that was in Norway. That's where it was in Norway, dude. Right. You know, <clears throat> and we could pause for a second because um, the bandwagon, we saw BB King's band play somewhere in Germany. And I remember it specifically because, you know, like B.B. King, okay, great, right? Blues legend, right? You know, lots of songs, you know, you kind of know them as an entity. Um, And so we went to see the band because we're like, well, we're here at this festival. We have nothing to do today. Let's go watch B.B. King's band. We stood on the side of the stage and B.B. King would play these interludes or these, you know, intros, basically. Sounded crazy what he was playing. Sound like Ava, like it was just like all angular, displaced, like a collage of 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 uh, of, of of 
the Delta, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then out of the blue, the band would come in like a lightning strike and go, and, and we were like, wait, what just happened? Right. Yo, and then happen? he did it like four songs in a row. We were like, we, you know, we thought we had a cue system as a band, right? But this was just, <laughs> he was shredding us. He melted us that night. That band sounded so great. And so I remember afterwards we talked to BB King. A lot of those musicians, or about five of them, were from Houston. So I was I saw talked to some of them, but the drummer, I don't know if it was the same drummer who's talked about your case, but he came off stage and he just took a goblet of wine and he just all right, so that's that probably is the same gentleman that we're speaking about, because this guy was like he gobbled his wine walking past me and said a comment about my case, and then that, I think it's a drummer. Yeah, it's yeah, it yeah. sounds like the same scenario. <laughs> but uh, Jason, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. No, on. it's I a really pleasure. Pleasure it. to reconnect, brother. Yeah, well, you weren't that easy to catch, man. I mean, like you know, I emailed you like five months ago, and you just got back to me the other day. So you know. So I really wanted you to come on. So I just want to say thank you. That means you. I kept you with me all this time. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hold my saxophone, dude? <laughs> um, so speaking of, I uh, for these you know episodes and interviews, whatever, I I reach out to my audience in various forms. I, I used to post about it, but then sometimes whoever was coming on the show would see it and would be all prepared and shit. This mm -hmm. one came in like this morning, hot and fast before. And uh, Elisa or Alicia, I, I'm not, I've never met her in person. I only know her through social media. Uh, sent me this article from, do you remember the name of the? Something of current affair or? Current affair, but not, I mean, not the. Pop Not culture, the, a current affair, but some, it's just called something like that, right? Currentaffair.com. Mm -hmm. And it says the synopsis is a closer look at the ec economics of black pop culture reveals that most black creators outside of music come from middle to upper middle class backgrounds, while the mm -hmm. black poor are written about but rarely get their chance to speak for themselves. And the author is Bertrand Cooper. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. And later, Bertrand goes on to say that, in, for instance, like if, if George Floyd was alive, mm. you know, that spawned a whole movement, right? So mm. we need more, you know, diversity in Broadway. We need more diversity in films and mm. TV and Netflix and so on, and Disney mm -hmm. Plus. But that George Floyd himself probably never would have had the chance to be in that position himself. Had, mm. had the, that horrific incident ever happened. That's mm. sort of a summation of the article that I know you didn't have uh, time to fully read or-, or, or Right. Um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, when I was reading it, also he brings up, because um, George Floyd is from Houston, uh, from the neighborhood that I'm from. Uh, oh, wow. When he talks about CUNY homes, it's called the CUNY homes. And CUNY Homes uh, is where my mother is from and all her sisters and my uncle. Um, CUNY Homes is across the street from Texas Southern University, you know, where my parents met um, a, a HBCU in the heart of Third Ward, a historic black neighborhood in Houston. Um, and I was just in Houston a few weeks ago, finally uh, to take my family back down there to see our family. Um, that's still in Texas and, and riding through Houston and thinking about all of the things that have changed and the things that have not changed. And, um, and when I think about uh, part of what I read in the article, because it's a really well thought out and thorough piece of uh, in research, really, um, is that it did make me think about pop, pop music, which is not where I live, you know, um, at all. And it made me think about um, like what was James Reese Europe, you know? What makes me think about like what was Bessie Smith, uh, what was Nina Simone, right? Coming from, you know? And it made me think more about, I, I need to take the pop part out of it because that is so far beyond and it's a different kind of uh, plantation system, um, but all related. <laughs> right. I do want to say that those plantations are definitely related, you know, and because I need to take the pop part out because there's a, a sense that there's a, 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 
how m money um, infects culture. And even thinking about, you know, the era we were just talking about, the 20s and the 30s, you know, when that music becomes pop music, but it's not. But it starts off as one thing and then gets co-opted into another. And that becomes what I have learned over time that then music and culture then becomes a weapon against those that make, make it. And that's not a new thing. That's a very old idea. And that idea uh, is actually generated in the plantation system itself. And in, I'm talking about black plantation, I mean, enslaved black folks on plantations in America for hundreds of years. And here's, here is, here is, give you this premise because this is not a premise I'm making up. This is what the history is. The history is, is if you have the person who sings really well out there in the field, then everyone who has to work, then will work better and faster. If someone is out there singing those songs, if you have the good singer out there. Now, right now, in addition to the person who is strong that has stood up there on the block, right? With the body and the physique that, you know, I mean, I just am coming from Richmond, Virginia, where I walked one of these trails where people were taken off of the, the, the slave ship and marched into downtown Richmond. And then their underground fed food right, for five weeks until they were, quote unquote, plumped up to then be put on the block. Wow. Huh. And so we can talk about right now all we want to, but for me, these things are so old and so tied into when we have nothing that really what is in it, what it, what is in, <clears throat> for me has to be interrogated is, is the whiteness part of it. Um, and that and that then becomes the question about how how do we discuss it, right? Is it, right. it is a conversation that black people are supposed to continue to have with each other? Because from all I know and from all the old books I'm reading, people have been writing about this for 150 years, writing about it. And you have to say that also the writing part was not also offered to black folks. So black people were writing down their stories and sharing their histories under threat of death. <laughs> you know, to do that. Yeah. Can ahead, I can I interject? Yeah. So speaking with uh, my friend Adam Cooper, who's a high level software engineer in the world and is very successful and also a black man, American black man, African American, I guess, but uh, although he doesn't like that terminology, mm -hmm. but uh, he, he says people think that black, that the black America has left the plantation. He goes, we've never left the plantation. Oh, no, baby. R what? Oh no. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, I'm just in case there's somebody out there who needs to be educated like yeah. me, even though I'm a gay man, I'm still a white man. And like hearing one of your good friends who you thought you knew say, yeah, we black America has really never left the plantation because I'm very fortunate. I have mm. a skill that, that a lot of people in mm. the, you know, the community don't have. And mm. so he gets paid very well to do what he does and it's well-deserved. But he goes, there's so many, and maybe George Floyd was one of them, that they, they just don't get that opportunity to float no. out outside, right? No, no, they don't. And it, you know, and it's a thing that I've been really inspired by over the past, let's say five years of watching, you know, of watching a new generation of activism rise, which was unafraid of kind of really trying to break down more of the systems that they can see clearly need restructuring. Um, and I think for our generation, right, we can see a certain thing, but we can't see it with the eyes of a 22 year old, you know? Yeah. Like I think of Fred Hampton, you know, like what he was able to see before he was assassinated, it was mind boggling, but he was able to see it really clearly and put his language with it too, and to try to hit people with it. And um, watching the movement rise, you know, in the past few years. Um, but also, I always am thinking that this is then the setup for a new kind of, you know, I don't know what would you call it? You know, a I paradigm this, or something like that, a new paradigm? Yes. I don't, know, I don't know what word to use either, but that's the word I would but use. It's, but it's on the precipice. Um, and, <laughs> and, I, and I have faith in, that, in those, those minds that are, that, and those bodies and, and more often than not, those women <laughs> right. um, that are really pushing 
um, pushing for the change and are unafraid to stand in the fire. Um, and that, you know, and we need all different kinds of that movement too. And it cannot all look the same and it cannot all speak the same language and it cannot all satisfy the same goals. Um, and I think when we choose music, we're trying to choose music that way too. Like, I don't need to play eight of the same song, you know? I have to find like some way to shade this to show, oh, well, there's also this part of the conversation that I need to amplify tonight, you know? And during the pan past year, like a person who did that for me most frequently was Toni Morrison, and, you know, and she's passed away a few years ago, but because she spoke so clearly in her novels um, and in her thinking that she was a thing that I could rely on as a truth when nobody knew about what was true about COVID or not, you know, and we couldn't get to any stages. And so you couldn't play your truth out either. You just had to kind of put it on silent mode. And in that silence, I was reading her and she centered, recentered me uh, for a kind of getting back to my teaching part, you know, making sure that I was becoming a better teacher, not the same teacher, you know, uh, that I was. And it's hard, you know, um, but it, but I've been really also inspired by people who hit the streets in the middle of a pandemic. Yep. And, 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 and we're asking for, for the change and to actually start to see some of it now too. And I'm looking for the, the five years, you know, from now, what that will feel like and see what those changes turn out there, to be. There was a lot of conversation about where, you know, in the Vietnam War, there was all this music and all these yeah. things happening or like, well, and you're talking about James Reese Europe during mm -hmm. World War One, But a lot of this came out of those eras. Mm -hmm. it, it happened. It was it was inspired during but then mm -hmm. things started to come out of it. Mm -hmm. And so my feeling about this, uh, the whole pandemic, COVID, whatever people want to call it, but like, where is the inspiration? Well, I'll tell you what, it, uh, by the way, so you got one of your, um, let me point to it correctly. It, that's right. yours, right? Um, <laughs> oh yeah, that one there, yeah, yeah. yeah that is one that there. the one done in the piano? Yeah, it is, uh, yeah. But, but I, I think, and you can totally disagree with me that there's going to be a lot that's going to be coming as mm -hmm. we move forward. Like you said, what, five years, maybe four years. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. it's hard to pick a time frame, you know, it like, is. Uh, but yeah, but we'll feel it because right. that's just kind of how history works. Right. And I think you and I have studied enough history to know how these things end up kind of like surfacing and also watching a lot of musicians in this time also shift their location. You know, some of them left the city, some of them left LA, some of them went back to their hometowns. That's huge, you know, for me, I think it's huge when, when, when someone returns to the soil that they, that they are from and decides to really make from that place again. Um, that changes a whole nother 10, 15 years of what it will come out of that city. Um, cultural people who come back with that in mind. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot happening. There always is though. I think sometimes maybe that was what I would sometimes, I wouldn't say I was nervous about for some of my younger students I was just wondering where were they finding their teeth? You know, like, like what were you biting into, you know, like. So what's an example of, of singing your teeth and like you, you at Sweet Basil, me at the Village Gate, mm -hmm. uh, right? Or like I, my first jazz concert, I got to see Count Basie when I was 12 or 13. And his, oh, wow. he was in a wheelchair, but it oh, was wow. the Count Basie Orchestra. And it was just right. like, what? Like, thing. to me, that's what I think you mean by teeth. And then I would go to a mm -hmm. jam session, you know, even if it was at my school. But mm -hmm. is that what you mean? Like, It is partially what I mean. But I also mean, what is the, what is the shit you care about, you know? <laughs> like, Listen like, up, what, folks. <laughs> that's like, what, right. Just period. And, yeah. and me as a teacher, I have to, I have to, my, I think part of my job is to really talk to a student enough to then hopefully find out what they really care about and then help them find the way for them to find the moment where their, their passion and then their music actually meet up. Sometimes people keep it way, way separate. And um, True that. I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, I really think the sooner you figure out that you should look at your nose, <laughs> Right. Better. And uh, and sometimes we go looking for the thing very far away when really it's, you know, 
It's in all the messed up ways you learn to learn. It's, it's all it's all here. It's already there. And and I, and I hope yeah. uh, Ken Chaphorse doesn't fire you for cussing so much on my show. But I, <laughs> I appreciate your candidness because it, it's one of those things that like, I mean, I had Ted Reichman on and two of his mm-hmm. students, do you know, uh, Adrian Shabla or Kate Byrne? Do you know them? Maybe if I see them. Yeah. Okay. And I just found, I, I think their music, speaking of like making right. part, party music, whatever that is. Okay. <laughs> I'm not talking about people drinking a lot or whatever. If right. they want to, they can. Or drinking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> or drinking a lot. But Adrian and Kate, you know, our TED students in the contemporary mm. improvisation department, but mm. they're making this. And I, I only say it that way because TED is, is cultivating Jeez, this yes, creation great. that is exactly what you're talking about. In my yeah. opinion about they're both of them can't see past their own. You say nose, but they can't see past their own face mm. and it's not egotistical. It's right. their, the, the effect that the world is having on them is then coming out in this, what I think is amazing music, at least. Yes, I, I I would agree without even heard them, hearing them, but I know what you're talking about, that kind of energy that when you hear a student really kind of, they're able to turn in on them, turn in to themselves. You know, I was writing about the difference between that Miles Davis presents uh, in like 1959 versus his predecessors on the trumpet. This painter, Sam Gilliam, a really great abstract painter, uh, has been listening to music and always and knows a lot of these musicians, Ornette, Miles, all these people, hangs out with them forever, right? So he's developing a painting style that would also go in line with how Ornette talks about her melodics. So Sam Gilliam is talking about hearing this record, uh, uh, Miles Davis' Sketches of Spain. And so he brings the record home and puts it on the turntable and Sam Gilliam's mother Sam Gilliam is grown by this time. He's not like a kid. He's he's a grown man by this time. And his mother says, "Who is that on the that trumpet trying to learn how to play?" <laughs> and I had to think about oh what God. his mother might have been hearing. You right. know, what is that that they're hearing in that context? Right. And I said, and I and it, and it made me think about. Okay, right. So the trumpet, just in itself, Louis Armstrong kind of makes the trumpet the a thing coming out of cornet from let, let's say King Oliver. He makes the trumpet the instrument with a sound that does a certain thing and it goes out yeah. and it and it and it's the center of the sound right, right? Dizzy gillespie fast navarro all these people they do that they're like keeping it the center piercing and then all of a sudden miles kind of if he puts a mute on or if he's cracking a note he's all of a sudden making this thing that has been so brash now he's un he's unafraid to show the frailty of it Hmm. And in the 60s also, right? So like that there's a, a tenderness and it is not made of steel, this thing, you know? And he doesn't point it in the air, he points it at the ground, right? All of these are signs that there's a turn in what we're gonna have to, how we're gonna have to think about art. Um, and that, that sensitivity that I think a lot of artists are now talking about, self-care, you know, mental health, you know, all of these things that, that musicians are really having to make sure that they take care of for their own well-being. I think Miles, and we know the problems he's had, you know, in his life. Um, that also he's showing that he's not trying to show this kind of like like hard sound, but he's going to show the crack. And the mother is hearing it like, yeah, but this you guy, know, but I- this guy needs to learn how to play. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it though, you know. I, I, you, you know, it. I had um, a good friend of mine, Peter Roth, on the show. He he is now almost eighty, mm. and he's a healer. And he got to meet Cicely Tyson mm. mm-hmm. a few months. They were doing the same treatments because mm. she was ill, and and mm-hmm. at that time, uh, Peter Roth was ill. And Cicely Tyson, for as much as Miles was a like whatever let's not get negative we all know that that miles had his issues Mm -hmm. you know she was saying some really cool shit that Mm -hmm. unfortunately i'm not allowed to say because peter my uncle peter says i i I feel like it's a breach of our trust Mm -hmm. that she had with me but Mm -hmm. she painted miles as a pretty pretty beautiful and and incredibly innovative person they had and they had a long relationship right Yeah. yeah you know i mean all relationships are None of them are perfect. Right. Um, and there's no excuse 
uh, for the kinds of things he did to many of his his uh, um, his partners, um, and it you know and it brings up a lot of issues, right? Like uh, how we champion figures, you know, uh, how we take down monuments as they're doing in Richmond, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do we reassess like their centrality to the conversation around music or about citizenry or love, you know? And uh, and I think those all those things are healthy and necessary. Yeah. Um, and and I think you should you each person should be a judge of what they're willing to accept and not accept, uh, and listen to or not listen to, uh, patronize or not patronize, you know. Um, and everybody's diet is different, but yeah, Sicily and Miles, like just like that, that's a long relationship that they have. Is even deep. even just hearing their two names together gives me goosebumps, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I have this amazing photo that my uncle Peter sent me of the two of them, which is mm. a, everybody knows this photo, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and just their energy together. Yeah. And you know, I, I guess what I hear you saying, and even if you're not, this is what I'm saying. Okay. First of all, don't let's not hurt each other. Let's not kill each other. And let's mm. not like, you know, beat our wives or husband, you know, let's not do any of our kids. Right. But if you feel anger, that's fine. Feel mm. your anger. If mm. you feel uh, sad and you need to cry, go ahead. Please. And then, right. A a or anything in between, you feel happy mm -hmm. as I do, like getting you know, hang out with Jason Moran for a while mm -hmm. here, which is totally mm -hmm. amazing. It's like, mm -hmm. That's that's that is art right is. there. And yeah. I did this like I don't know what you want to call it, like a early on in COVID. So it was like April or March of 2020. I did it like the symposium, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe there was like 50 people on the Zoom call. So you can imagine the shit show that was. <laughs> but I looked at everybody, and there were people from India, there were people from China, there were people from Japan, there were people all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. Australia, New Zealand. And I could just see that everybody's like, I'm not writing that book that I should be writing, you know, while we're in quarantine, or I'm not writing that opera, or I'm not writing that whatever, or I'm not doing that, making that movie. And I said, everybody calm down. Mm. Said, you are doing it. Mm. And it will come when the timing is right. That's right. It, and everybody was shaking their head like you, right? We're all new to Zoom. So everybody was muted and they're all going, yeah. Yeah. And I talked to this one girl and she was, I think, 23. She's from India. She was sitting on a pillow and she goes, yeah, I live with my five brothers. I was like, in India, I'm like, holy shit. She goes, well, I really want to write this book. I was like, I don't know how you can get anything done under mm. normal circumstances, mm -hmm. but don't beat yourself up if you can't yeah. write right now because you are. It yeah. will come. But yeah. the reality is that we need to feel that stuff. Like I put my saxophone down for, I don't know, a month or six mm -hmm. weeks. And mm -hmm. I'd sometimes I'd get up and I'd be like, oh man, I should play. But it's like, I, I don't really feel like playing. I right? Mean, yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then when I finally got to play and I, like you said, we finally got to travel and I did a couple of shows out of town. I was like, oh, I'm actually enjoying myself. Yes. That's going to be important. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, it's I kind of really got important. to a point where the gig was just like, when is this fucking thing over so I can get <laughs> back to the hotel? I, I'm not going to lie. That's just me. And a few people agree with me. But, you know, after 35 yeah. years, sometimes on tour, I'm like, you know, let's just get this thing over with and, like, get me back to my room so I can, like, hit the mini bar or whatever I'm going to do. <laughs> what? Yeah. No, it's it's a – it's – yeah, yeah, come on, yeah. I don't even know where we are in this, you know. I mean, I, I, I've been behind this computer right here is my my piano, and it's it's looking at me, and I and I play. Um. But I know my muscles, you know, have changed a lot. Just like just just the musculature is not willing to do what it was doing before, just because it hasn't been doing it. Uh, I'm hopeful that the fall and the sp and the winter and the spring and the next four months kind of gets people back, you know, just into that mode again, because, you know, back to way back to earlier in the conversation when you're talking about Lee Conan's talking about Ellington them and them always playing, right. you know, 
it's just for the health of the music. People will need to be on their instrument, whether yeah. it's public or private. But I, I, I uh, but it's been difficult. Right, and I, I mean, you did fuck up the entertainer on that interview, right? So there's that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I figured you did that on purpose, and we're just like having fun. But I, I, I you were like, ah, I was doing some Thelonious Monk shit there, so that's why I played the <laughs> right. <high step. laughs> I'm, that was so great. It was terrible. I was like, oh, look, no, no, so, no, somebody no, who, no, no, somebody no, who no. really cares about that is like, uh-uh. No. Uh -uh. <laughs> exact opposite. Because afterwards, you you had fun with yourself, which I think is important, right? <laughs> and second of all, you were like, you hear that music, and I don't remember what the other, you played another song, like a, a little snippet. You said, this was like rebellion music back in the day. And yeah. now when we hear the entertainer, or what do you remember the other one you played? I don't remember I which don't, one it was. Yeah, yeah. And uh like those songs to us are just like whatever happy go lucky pop yeah. tunes. Yeah. But at that time, that you were saying that shit was super like it's deep in the moment, right? Yeah. I mean, there was some rebellion going on here. Yeah. And I, I had never thought about that. And you did make a couple of mistakes. It did not sound like shit, but I <laughs> I really wanted to make it. Oh, I hope you don't make me take this out because it was a really amazing moment. And I had my headphones on and the audio was really nice and you sounded amazing. And you're like, I haven't warmed up yet. And I'm like, dude, you sound incredible. I mean, you sound incredible. <laughs> oh, man. You know, like for musicians, you know this, Andrew, right? Like we have a sound in our head, right? Right. And then when we play, then to a degree, we might be trying to match those two. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, right. Well, of course, things change, but like you know, right. But but I think I think part of that is, um, that, like I just I played the sh uh, the show in Washington D.C. Right. Okay. So mm. it's not a promo or anything. So I traveled down there. That was kind of the first time I'd done, done lengthy travel. But when I got on stage and it was time to play in mm. front of like hundreds of people, right. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really played in, like I said, a month or six weeks. I appreciated that I could play I anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, well, this isn't the best read. It's kind of yeah. hot out. So my saxophone's kind of sharp. But right. none of that mattered all of a sudden. I just mm. was like, I can play. Yeah. I'm alive. I'm in yeah. the moment. These people Say are that. all standing there just going, wow, this guy's playing. Uh, what is that? Is that a saxophone? Right? Uh, I, I, I kid about the saxophone thing, but it was yeah. just, so you're right. I, I think we, all artists, both your visual art and mm. our, our instruments, we have an idea, but for me, the break helped me come back with this- uh, Love it. Fruition, I is that a that. word? Yeah. Or volition, I'm not sure of the word. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, here I'm just playing in, you know, an A flat or a G mm -hmm. and man, this is really fun. And yeah. so therefore it was fun for people to listen to. Yeah. I don't know if I was in tune. I don't know if I sounded good, but people were into it because I was into it. Does that make right. any sense to you? Hell yeah, it does. And that will be like the gauge that people will have to, I well, you know, whatever. That's, that's one of my gauges was like, look, I, I, if I'm gonna leave the house and play, I better have some fun on this. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, <laughs> By the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jason Moran charges a quarter of a million dollars for every show that he does. Right. So, <laughs> which is the equivalent in 1919 of $250. Uh, but uh, Jason, again, I've just had so much fun talking to you. Uh, Thank you too. for being here. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I have, there, there's just such a plethora of things to speak to as far as your your career and your life and your artistic output and i'm sorry we didn't get to your visual art but mm. maybe we will because this morning at fucking 4 13 a.m i got a call from seaman halverson who's this norwegian trumpet player um who i've known since he was like 13 or something he's 30 now mm. because uh, they had to cancel some shows i was going to do there in september because of the coronavirus the delta variant Oof. bummer but it happens Damn. and i said Dude, I was trying to get some sleep because I'm having Jason Moran on, man. I got to get some rest, right? And he says, you got to check out his record, All Rise. Mm. It's such a great record. 
And so here I am then, I don't know, I talked for semen to semen for like an hour or something. And then it's, so it's like 5.36 a.m. I'm like, all right. So I put on your record, poured some coffee. I was like, I'll just stay up all night. And it, dude, that Fats Waller record yeah. is so good. Do you want to tell us about it? I mean, I could talk to you about it, but I yeah, mean, yeah, not sure. It's called All Rise and uh, it's a joyful elegy for Fats Waller. Um, and it's really, it's made in con with the great bassist and singer, songwriter, Michelle Indegi Ocello, who is, yeah. she is- She is amazing. She is unbelievable. And um, so we made this record about Fats Waller's music because this place here in Harlem called Harlem Stage was commissioning people to make records about figures from Harlem. And they asked if I would think about Fats Waller. And I said, well, I'll think about Fats Waller, but Fats Waller was a party, so. <laughs> I need to make, you know, you know, you got to make some party music then, yeah. you know, something at least that acknowledges that people are supposed to. Is that why uh, I cracked a beer at seven in the morning? Because <laughs> I was yeah. drinking coffee, but then I'm listening to your record. And I'm like, this is kind of party music in my opinion. Yeah, and yeah. I was up all and night. Also, so you know, like matter. much like what we were talking about before, you know, which there's a, you know, like he's making a lot of that music during the Great Depression. So he's also trying to help people lose a sense of their worries, right? You know, right. so like, nah, you know, well, let's think about it this way. And um, so what music do you make in a time when everything seems to be going wrong? You know, and he chose joy in that way. Now he died young also, you know, uh, and, and drinking a lot. So he had his own problems that he was dealing with, but his, but his technique and his mastery of the piano and of how to talk for and with people on record, you know, <gasps> about class and all that stuff. Like he brings all that stuff up. He writes Ain't Misbehaving, that very famous song. He writes that in jail for not paying his alimony, you know, <laughs> like, wow. So when you hear those lyrics, you know, uh, no one to talk with all by myself. <laughs> like, you, you, you know, you know, the thing is that one of the aspects of your playing, and this is something that's new to me since the pandemic from 2020 is I'll turn off the audio and I'll just watch. Hmm. And there's something about you. Hmm. It's like you're painting when you're hmm. playing. Maybe that's hmm. totally corny and maybe people no, like say that shit all the time. But, and then sometimes people say about my playing that they feel like I'm speaking to them or like hmm. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. saying something. I'm not just, right. and with Fats Waller, he had the benefit of, Right. Lyrics at mm -hmm. times. Yeah. yeah. But this song, Handful of Keys, right. that you yeah. play, for some reason really struck me, man. And yeah. I turned off the audio. And yeah, I was kind of tripping. I've been up all night. And I don't know if I cracked a beer at that point, but I was just like, it's 6 30 in the morning. And I'm like, dude, Jason is like painting. Mm, mm, yeah, I, yeah. Is that fair? And then it and is then, fair. I mean, I think we all are, you know, like, But it's like that, you know, with music, one of the things that is, is beautiful about our dedication to it is, is that it doesn't, I mean, of course there's music that pollutes, but <laughs> like it's invisible, you know? Right. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's vibration centered and it goes into people and you can't quantify its effects, you know? Not like on a chart, you know? Um, you're gonna say, oh, it was this loud, but, but you can't quantify how much it means, you know? And in that way, you know, Milford Graves talks about this, right? Like all these musicians for decades and decades have really found that music was much further than the notes that were on the page. Yeah. That their ability to change people was the thing worth spending time trying to craft and trying to work on so that you could be a benefit to your society rather than a detriment, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I think about that a lot, about how, uh, about how people have taught us how to paint sound, you know, and, and, send, and show it to people and have them feel it so that they could even feel it after they left, you know, after they stopped listening to it. And the great musicians, I feel like have done that, you know, even the ones who are terrible also do it. <laughs> oh my God, Jason just called some musicians terrible. I want everybody <laughs> to take note of that. All right, so if you're one of Jason's students at New England Conservatory, you might suck.
<laughs> but Jason loves you. Sorry. Sure I'm do. just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, the thing is that, uh, what is it? The, the sound will tell you. Do I have that mm. correct? Yeah. I don't feel like scrolling through my notes. Um, That's it. Yeah. And, and so that there's that uh, visual piece to your right with the blue mm. on it. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Which I believe you painted inside of a grand piano, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. As you played. Right. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. my understanding especially after being through brain cancer and all that stuff is that everything has a resonance mm -hmm. inanimate objects pianos mm -hmm. saxophones trumpets whatever chairs mm -hmm. that your work of art has mm -hmm. like there's something to be heard it may not be audible but there's an energy that can be felt mm -hmm. and i i know Mil milford was really into putting on uh Mm -hmm. uh what, what are those electro like ekg like, ekg yeah, like monos, and he yeah. would like get these students and he would say check out your ekg as i do stuff like play music or whatever he would do for them and mm -hmm. watch how you can feel it mm -hmm. yeah and he's like amp you know for and of the many things he innovates but he really but he really is listening to how the muscle sings of uh, the muscle of the heart how the heart muscle sings. And he found a way to amplify every movement that the heart makes, not just simply the boom, 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 right. but all the gradations in between. Interesting. And then he created a software that would make that into a melody. Milford was, you know, into that and really trying to heal people that way too, uh, himself included at the end. Um, so, you know, he was about that. And I think we all are, you know, the uh, to a degree, we have a belief system in that and that we can that we can charge up the room uh without you ever really seeing how it's done but but feeling it but don't, don't you think yes I, I mean i'm just i'm just gonna say yes i agree for those who aren't watching but are listening i'm, I'm shaking my head yes and i absolutely agree with everything jason just said but i think that what's important is that our um you know, our students and people who are coming at, you know, our predecessors or no, people who come after us. What is that called? I can't remember. But uh, that they, that there needs to be a conscious understanding that you have mm. a lot of power mm. when you're making yes. your music yeah. and yeah. you're creating or you're painting or you're talking. Mm. And again, I'm okay with anger. I'm okay with crime. I'm okay mm -hmm. with hugging. I'm okay, mm -hmm. and not in a Andrew Cuomo kind of way, but I'm, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that there's not this, sometimes <laughs> for those musicians, you said that suck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's not what you said. I'm just having fun. No, right. right. <laughs> it's not what Jason Moran said, folks. Andrew D'Angelo is just having a good time here. But, but I, yeah. I think yeah. sometimes there's like a, some 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 of younger musicians and maybe some of my students are are, are wielding this sword and they don't know it. Yeah, like, and, I, gotta, look, and also I think that's okay. I I think because I think at a, at a at a certain point, look I, was I thinking about any of this stuff when I was 19, 20, 21? Hell no. I mean even into like my early was I really thinking? Hell no, I wasn't. Hmm. But I think over time, then I think. The only reason I would start to learn about it is because I went out and played in front of people enough and I watched how music affected people. And then I started paying attention to how music affects me when I go out and see music. Right. So, right, me yelling at that Kenny Garrett concert is like was one emotion, right, that I felt. But then it would take 10 years later for me to go see the Handel Opera to still feel the same thing. Or just even like two Fridays ago, I went to see a Mets game. I hadn't gone to a sports uh, uh, game in forever and I took my children to their first baseball game and I lost my voice yelling at the Mets game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because well, I was into like that feeling of kind of like yeah. yelling for a team, you know? Um yeah. and and it's visceral. And um and I think for us musicians we we have a lot that we'll have to try to feel. Uh but I definitely wasn't thinking about it. I wanted to make sure when I was young I'll say but I wanted to make sure that I didn't that I was satisfying my own like drive to make good music. And I wanted to 
I wanted to get on the other side of that hump of making bad music to making good music. <laughs> I wanted to get across that. And I was just what I was working on. And without really like stepping back to knowing kind of like, oh, what's Andrew talking about right now? You know what I mean? Um, but, I, you know, that would have made me, I think some of the things may have changed if I'd had some of that awareness early on that I, that I feel like I'm just learning now at 47 years old, you know? It, and it's, it's, it's also... I mean, if we're if we're going to walk down the path of good and bad music, OK, to me, it's not about that dexterity that you were talking about in your fingers or my read or my which saxophone yeah. I use. It, yeah. it are people enjoying themselves yeah. and whatever that means to them. Yeah. And so I, I know that when I was younger, I could give a flying fuck what the audience thought. And mm. I, I regret that on some level. I, I, was, mm. I wished when I was 25, that I had been more interested in what my, my audience, even if it was only three people at like, let's mm. say the knitting factory or something. Mm. Oh. Right. Yeah. I yeah. wish, I wish I was more like, Hey, are you enjoying yourself? And if you're not, how can I help you enjoy yourself more? Cause Woo! to me, Yo, but, check that out, man. Well, I mean, like that's deep. What you just said, <laughs> but I'm, tr I'm trying to imagine <laughs> all these shows we've been to. If, if the band, if Farrell Sanders would say to the audience, you know, are you all right? Well, for those of you who aren't, how can I help you? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> literally. Say, yeah. Can you imagine somebody at the, the caliber of Pharaoh Sanders <laughs> stopping and saying, how can I help you? What is yeah. it that you need? Although I think Pharaoh was working on a, another That's level of consciousness. Definitely. Like so I remember, yeah. Whether people liked it or not, they were yeah. getting what they were asking for. That's my opinion. Very true. Very true. But and you also can change my mind. Because they, you know, those musicians are making sure that they heal themselves in the process. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like, it ain't just going out like this helps me tremendously. I need this. I remember seeing Pharaoh Sanders at the Village Vanguard and he brought, you know, one of those singing bowls up, you know, and just for, for maybe five minutes at the beginning of the set, we just listened to this pitch come out of this bowl in the Village Vanguard, you know, before he launched into his saxophone playing. And I was like, oh, he's making this a ceremony. Yeah. You know, and and we felt that. And, um, you know, those things, yeah, that, you know, I mean, it makes me reminisce about just what it felt like to go out and watch something, which I'm sure will resume to some degree soon. Um, and I look forward to that. Those other ceremonies to, that I'll feel. Yeah. Uh, me too. And Jason, I just want to tell people that they can hear you in I think September at the Village Vanguard. Are you playing there in September? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, we'll see. Right. <laughs> this was Ron Miles and Frizzell and uh, who else is playing? I think Brian Blade and, and Thomas Morgan. Yeah, with Ron Miles at the Vanguard in September. Yeah, so, we'll see if clubs open like that, you know. I don't know, if it would be today, I'd be like, I'm not sure. The Vanguard has not opened, you know, all yeah. during this time, so. I know. <sighs> up in the air. Mm -hmm. Right, and same like with this tour that's crumbling for me in Europe. Mm. So it's it you know they cancel stuff in Holland because they closed the Hague down. Oh uh, wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just uh, so anyway. Who knows? But my yeah. here's what I want to say: that you have some of the highest quality video content on YouTube that I've experienced, and I, I that's something about especially jazz musicians, sometimes, you know, they just have their phone and stuff and the audio is not great or the video is not great, but your content is super high level, but maybe you have resources that not everybody else has. So I, I reckon we'll put some links uh, in, you know, down below so people can, can, can go wander around. I'd like to put that um, all rise. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you did this performance at the Kennedy center. I think Josh Roseman was playing and Nasheed, uh, Waits was playing. Mm. Was that the James Reese Europe? What was that? Oh, what? I'm not sure which one it was. There is one. I'm not sure it's still up online. Uh, yeah, there's one the I James watched. Reese. It's yeah. all side shot. So it was hard right. for me to identify the all band. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I, James Reese Europe piece. Yeah. 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 It, and it's a great concert. And yeah. I was walking around my house just listening. I wasn't watching. And I heard a, a trombone solo was the first thing that happens. All right, early on. And yeah. I was like, is that Josh? Yeah, no, that's Josh is on the he's on the All Rise record. Josh is. Oh, okay, yeah. so maybe that's why I heard it. And yeah. then I saw Nasheed, who's been yeah. on the show. 
Yeah. And the sheet waste is just absolutely miserable. Yeah. Anyway, go Phenomenal. go find some Jason Jason Moran. And, uh, Andrew, you know, thank you uh, for 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 doing this and 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 writing and reaching out and and um, and being around. Um, Thanks. And for your your recovery. <laughs> oh well, you know, so it's the least I can do, man. But that no, I have really. to annoy people for another like you know twenty years at least, right? <laughs> well, thankful for your recovery because thank you, man. That you know we we were we were all pulling for you, so it's just also good to see you. I appreciate it. It's great to see you. And I don't know. I have a nice night. Yeah, and you too. Uh, I hope to we get to run into each other at some we point. Shall. And uh, all right. Next time we'll talk about what it was like to be a parent during COVID. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go do that now. I think uh. we'll leave it at that. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Talk to you later, Jason. All right. See you. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Constant Constance. Tune in every week for new conversations. And if you want even more, check out Andrew's Patreon for more exclusive content and additional conversations. Hosted and produced by Andrew D'Angelo. Edited and mixed by Lucy Little. Original music by Andrew D'Angelo and Maximilian Moore D'Angelo. Intro is Henrietta Weeks. Thanks so much. See you next time. You you fucking, yeah, you fucking rocked it. Like you she doesn't it. she doesn't know she says podcast, right? <laughs> like she doesn't even